Chapter 17. Jem, I said, are those the Yule sitting down yonder? Hush, said Jem. Mr. Heck Tate's testifying. Mr. Tate had dressed for the occasion. He wore an, wore an ordinary business suit, which made him look somehow like every other man. Gone were his high boots, lumber jacket, and bullet-studded belt. From that moment, he ceased to terrify me. He was sitting forward in the witness chair, his hands clasped between his knees, listening attentively to the circuit solicitor. The solicitor, a Mr. Gilmer, was not well known to us. He was from Abbotsville. We saw him only when court convened, and that rarely, for court was of no special interest to Jem and me. A balding, smooth-faced man, he could have been anywhere from 40 and 60, between 40 and 60. Although his back was to us, we knew he had a slight cast in one of his eyes, which he used to his advantage. He seemed to be looking at a person when he was actually doing nothing of the kind. Thus, he was hell on juries and witnesses. The jury, thinking themselves under close scrutiny, paid attention. So did the witnesses, thinking likewise. In your own words, Mr. Tate, Mr. Gilmer was saying. Well, Mr. Well, said Mr. Tate, touching his glasses and speaking to his knees. I was called. Could you say it to the jury, Mr. Tate? Thank you. Who called you? Mr. Tate said, I was fetched by Bob, by Mr. Bob Yule yonder one night. What night, sir? Mr. Tate said, it was the night of November 21st. I was just leaving my office to go home when, when Bob, I mean, Mr. Yule came in. Very excited he was, and he said to get out to his house quick. Some N would raped his girl. Did you go? Certainly. I got in the car and I went out as fast as I could. And what did you find? Found her laying on the floor in the middle of the front room. One on the right, one on the right as you go in. She was pretty well beat up, but I heaved her to her feet and she washed her face in a bucket in the corner, and she said she was all right. I asked her who hurt her, and she said it was Tom Robinson. Judge Taylor, who had been concentrating on his fingernails, looked up as if he were expecting an objection, but Atticus was quiet. I asked her if he beat her like that. She said yes, he had. I asked her if he took advantage of her, and she said yes, he, he did. So I went down to Tom Robinson's house and brought him back. She identified him as the one, so I took him in. That's all there was to it. Thank you, said Mr. Gilmer. Judge Taylor said, any questions, Atticus? Yes, said my father. He was sitting behind his table. His chair was skewed to one side. His legs were crossed and one arm was resting on the back of his chair. Did you call a doctor, Sheriff? Did anybody call a doctor? Asked Atticus. No, sir, said Mr. Tate. You didn't call a doctor? No, sir, repeated Mr. Tate. Well, why not? There was an edge to Atticus's voice. Well, I can tell you why I didn't. It wasn't necessary, Mr. Finch. She was mighty banged up. Something show happened. It was obvious. But you didn't call a doctor. While you were there, did anyone send for one, fetch one, carry her to one? No, sir. Judge Taylor broke in. He's answered the question three times, Atticus. He didn't call a doctor. Atticus said, I just wanted to make sure, Judge. And the judge smiled. Jem's hand, which was resting on the balcony rail, tightened around it. He drew in his breath suddenly. Glancing below, I saw no corresponding reaction, and wondered if Jem was trying to be dramatic. Dill was watching peacefully, and so was Reverend Sykes beside him. What is it, I whispered, and got, got a terse, shh, Sheriff, Atticus was saying. You say she was mighty banged up. In what way? Well, just describe her injuries, heck. Well, she was beaten around the head. There was already bruises coming on her arms, and it happened about 30 minutes before. How do you know? Mr. Tate grinned. Sorry, that's what they said. Anyway, she was pretty bruised up when I got there, and she had a black eye coming. Which eye? Mr. Tate blinked and ran his hands through his hair. Let me see, he said softly. Then he looked at Atticus as if he considered the question childish. Can't you remember, Atticus asked. Mr. Tate pointed to an invisible person five inches in front of him, and said, her left. Wait a minute, Sheriff, said Atticus. Was it her left facing you, or her left looking the same way as you were? Mr. Tate said, oh yes, that would make it her right eye. It was her right eye, Mr. Finch. I remember now. She was banged up on that side of her face. Mr. Tate blinked again, as if something had suddenly been pl made plain to him. Then he turned his head and looked around at Tom Robinson, as if by instinct Tom Robinson raised his head. Something had been made plain to Atticus also, and it brought him to his feet. Sheriff, please repeat what you just said. It was a right eye, I said. 
No, Atticus walked to the court reporter's desk and bent down to the furiously scribbling hand. It stopped, flipped back the shorthand pad, and the court reporter said, Mr. Finch, I remember how she was banged up on that side of her face. Atticus looked up at Mr. Tate. Which side again, heck? The right side, Mr. Finch. But she had more bruises. You want to hear about them? Atticus seemed to be bordering on another question, but he thought better of it and said, Yes, what were her other injuries? As Mr. Tate answered, Atticus turned and looked at Tom Robinson as if to say this was something they hadn't bargained for. Her arms were bruised, and she showed me showed me her neck. There were definite finger marks on, a, on her gullet. All around her throat, at the back of her neck? I'd say they were all around, Mr. Finch. You would? Yes, sir. She had a small throat. Anybody could have reached around it with... Just answer the question, yes or no, please, Shara, said Atticus dryly, and Mr. Tate fell silent. Atticus sat down and nodded to the circuit solicitor, who shook his head at the judge, who nodded to Mr. Tate, who rose stiffly and stepped down from the witness stand. Below us, heads turned, feet scraped the floor, babies were shifted to shoulders, and a few children scampered out of the courtroom. The Negroes behind us whispered softly among themselves. Dill was asking Reverend Sykes what it was all about, but Reverend Sykes said he didn't know. So far, things were utterly dull. Nobody had thundered. There were no arguments between opposing counsel. There was no drama, a grave disappointment to all present, it seemed. Atticus was proceeding amiably, as if he were involved in a title dispute. With his infinite capacity for calming turbulent seas, he could make a rape case as dry as a sermon. Gone was the terror in my mind of stale whiskey and barn barnyard smells, of sleepy-eyed sullen men, of a husky voice calling in the night, Mr. Finch, they gone? Our nightmare had gone with daylight. Everything would come out all right. All the spectators were as relaxed as Judge Taylor, except for Jem. His mouth was twisted in a purposeful half-grin, and his eyes happy about, and he said something about corroborating evidence, which made me sure he was showing off. Robert E. Lee Ewell. In answer to the clerk's booming voice, a little bantam cock of a man rose and strutted to the stand, the back of his neck reddening at the sound of his own name. When he turned around to take the oath, we saw that his face was as red as his neck. We also saw no resemblance to his namesake. A shock of wispy, new-washed hair stood up from his forehead. His nose was thin, pointed, and shiny. He had no chin to speak of. It seemed to be part of his crepey neck. So help me God, he crowed. Every town the size of Maycomb had fam families like the Ewells. No economic fluctuations changed their status. People like the Ewells lived as guests of the county, in prosperity as well in the depths of depression. No truant officers could keep their numerous offspring in school. No public health officer could free them from congenital defects, various worms, and the diseases indigenous to filthy surroundings. Maycomb's Ewells lived behind the town garbage dump in what was once a Negro cabin. The cabin's plank walls were supplemented with sheets of corrugated iron, its roof shingled with tin cans hammered flat, so only its general shape suggested its original design. Square, with four tiny rooms opening into a shotgun hall, the cabin rested uneasily upon four irregular lumps of limestone. Its windows were merely open spaces in the walls, which in the summertime were covered with greasy strips of cheesecloth to keep out varmints that feasted on Maycomb's refuse. The varmints had a lean time of it, for the Yules gave the dump a thorough gleaning every day, and the fruits of their industry, those were that were not eaten, made the plot of ground around the cabin look like a playhouse of an insane child. What passed for a fence was bits of tree limbs, broomsticks, and tool shafts, all tipped with rusty hammerheads, snaggletooth rakeheads, shovels, axes, and grubbing hoes, held on with pieces of barbed wire. Enclosed by this barricade was a dirty yard containing the remains of a Model T on blocks, a discarded dentist's chair, an ancient ice box, plus lesser items, old shoes, worn-out table radios, picture frames, and fruit jars, under which scrawny orange chickens pecked, hopefully. One corner of the yard, though, bewildered Maycomb. Against the fence, in a line, were six chipped enamel slop jars, holding brilliant red geraniums, cared for as tenderly as if they belonged to Miss Maudie Atkinson had Miss Maudie deigned to permit a geranium on her premises. People said they were Mayella Ewells. Nobody was quite sure how many children were on the place. Some people said six, others said nine. 
There were always several dirty-faced ones at the windows when anyone passed by. Nobody had occasion to pass by except at Christmas when the churches delivered baskets and when the mayor of Maycomb asked us to please help the garbage collector by dumping our own trees and trash. Atticus took us with him last Christmas when he compiled, complied with the mayor's request. A dirt road ran from the highway past the dump down to a small Negro settlement some 500 yards beyond the Ewells. It was necessary either to back out to to back out to the highway or to go the full length of the road and turn around. Most people turned around in the Negroes' front yards. In the frosty December dusk, their cabins looked neat and snug with pale blue smoke rising from the chimneys and doorways glowing amber from the fires inside. There were delicious smells about chicken, bacon frying crisp in the, as the twilight air. Gemini detected squirrel cooking, but it took an old countryman like Atticus to identify possum and rabbit, aromas that vanished when we rode back past the Yule residence. All the little man on the witness stand set had had that made him any better than his nearest neighbors was that if he scrubbed with lye soap and very hot water, his skin was white. Mr. Robert Yule, asked Mr. Gilmer. That's my name, Captain, said the witness. Mr. Gilmer's back stiffened a little, and I felt sorry for him. Perhaps I'd better explain something now. I've heard that lawyers' children, on seeing their parents in court in the heat of an argument, get the wrong idea. They think that opposing counsel to be the personal enemies of their parents. They suffer agonies and are surprised to see them often go out arm in arm with their tormentors during the first recess. This was not true of Jem and me. We acquired no traumas from watching our father win or lose. I'm sorry that I can't provide any drama in this respect. If I did, it would not be true. We could tell, however, when debate came more acrimonious than professional, but this was from watching lawyers other than our father. I never heard Atticus raise his voice in my life except to a deaf witness. Mr. Gilmer was doing his job as Atticus was doing his. Besides, Mr. Ewell was Mr. Gilmer's witness, and he had no business being rude to him, of all people. Are you the father of Mayella Ewell? was the next question. Well, if I ain't, I can't do nothing about it now. Her ma's dead, was the answer. Judge Taylor stirred. He turned slowly in the swivel chair and looked benignly at the witness. Are you the father of Mayella Ewell, he asked, in a way that made the laughter below us stop suddenly. Yes, sir, Mr. Ewell said meekly. Judge Taylor went on in tones of goodwill. This the first time you've ever been in court? I don't recall ever seeing you here. At the witness's affirmative nod, he continued, Well, let's get something straight. There will be no more audibly obscene speculations on any subject from anybody in this courtroom as long as I'm sitting here. Do you understand? Mr. Ewell nodded, but I don't think he did. Judge Taylor sighed and said, All right, Mr. Gilmer. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ewell, would you tell us in your own words what happened on the evening of November 21st, please? Jem grinned and pushed his hair back. Just in your own words was Mr. Gilmer's trademark. We often wondered who else's words Mr. Gilmer was afraid his witness might employ. Well, the night of November 21, I was coming in from the woods with a load of kindling. Just as I got to the fence, I heard Mayella screaming like a stuck hog inside the house. Here, Judge Taylor glanced sharply at the witness and must have decided his speculations devoid of evil intent, for he subsided sleepily. What time was it, Mr. Yule? Just before sundown. Well, I was saying, Mayella was screaming fit to beat Jesus. Another glance from the bench silenced Mr. Ewell. Yes, she was screaming, said Mr. Gilmer. Mr. Ewell looked confused at, ju at the judge. Well, Mayella was raising this holy racket, so I dropped my load and run as fast as I could, but I run into the fence. But when I got disentangled, I run up to the window, and I seen Mr. Ewell's face grew scarlet. He stood up and pointed his finger at Tom Robinson. I seen that black man yonder rutting on my Mayella. So serene was Judge Taylor's court that he had few occasions to use his gavel, but he hammered it fully five minutes. Atticus was on his feet at the bench saying something to him. Mr. Heck Tate, as first officer of the county, stood in the middle aisle quelling the packed courtroom. Behind us, there was an angry muffled groan from the colored people. Reverend Sykes leaned across Dill and me, pulling at Jem's elbow. Mr. Jem, he said, you better take Miss Jean Louise home. Mr. Jem, you hear me? Jem turned his head. Scout, go home. Dill, you and Scout go home. You got to make me first, I said. I remember Atticus's blessed dictum. 
Jem scowled furiously at me and said to Miss, then said to Reverend Sykes, I think it's okay, Reverend. She doesn't understand it. I was mortally offended. I most certainly do. I can understand anything you can. Ah, hush. She doesn't understand it, Reverend. She ain't nine yet. Reverend Sykes' black eyes were anxious. Mr. Finch, know you all are here? This ain't fit for Miss Jean Louise or you boys either. Jem shook his head. Can't see us this far away. It's all right, Reverend. I knew Jem would win because I knew nothing could make him leave now. Dill and I were safe for a while. Atticus could see us from where he was if he looked. As Judge Teller banged his gavel, Mr. Ewell was sitting smugly in the witness chair, surveying his handiwork. With one phrase, he turned happy picnickers into sulky, tense, murmuring crowd, being slowly hypnotized by gavel taps, lessening in intensity, until the only sound in the courtroom was a dim pink, pink, pink. The judge might have been wrapping the bench with a pencil, in possession of his court once more, Judge Taylor leaned back in his chair. He looked suddenly weary. His age was showing, and I thought about what Atticus had said. He and Mrs. Taylor didn't kiss much. He must have been nearly 70. There has been a request, Judge Taylor said, that this courtroom be cleared of spectators, or at least of women and children, a request that will be not denied for the time being. People generally see what they look for and hear what they listen for, and they have the right to subject their children to it. But I can assure you of one thing. You will receive what you see and hear in silence, or you will leave this courtroom. But you won't leave it until the whole boiling of, your, of you come before me on contempt charges. Mr. Ewell, you will keep your testimony within the confines of Christian English usage, if that is possible. Proceed, Mr. Gilmer. Mr. Ewell reminded me of a deaf mute. I was sure he had never heard the words Judge Taylor directed at him. His mouth struggled silently with them, but their import registered on his face. Smugness faded from it, replaced by a dogged earnestness that fooled Judge Taylor not at all. As long as Mr. Ewell was on the stand, the judge kept his eyes on him, as if daring him to make a false move. Mr. Gilmer and Atticus exchanged glances. Atticus was sitting down again. His fist rested on his cheek, and he, we could not see his face. Mr. Gilmer looked rather desperate. A question from Judge Taylor made him relax. Mr. Ewell... Did you see the defendant having sexual intercourse with your daughter? Yes, I did. The spectators were quiet, but the defendant said something. Atticus whispered to him, and Tom Robinson was silent. You say you were at the window? asked Mr. Gilmer. Yes, sir. How far is it from the ground? About three feet. Did you have a clear view of the room? Yes, sir. How did the room look? What well, was all slung about, like there was a fight. What did you do when you saw the defendant? Well, I run around the house to get in, but he run out the front door just ahead of me. I saw who he was all right. I was too distracted about Mayella to run after him. I run in the house, and she was lying on the floor squalling. Then what did you do? Why, I run for Tate as quick as I could. I knowed who he was all right. Lived down yonder in that nest, past the house every day. Judge, I'd have asked this county for 15 years to clean out that nest down yonder. They're dangerous to live around, besides devaluing my property. Thank you, Mr. Ewell, said Mr. Gilmer hurriedly. The witness made a hasty descent from the stand and ran smack into Atticus, who had risen to question him. Judge Teller permitted the court to laugh. Just a minute, sir, said Atticus genially. Could I ask you a question or two? Mr. Ewell backed up into the witness chair, settled himself, and regarded Atticus with haughty suspicion, an expression common to make home county witnesses when confronted by opposing counsel. Mr. Ewell, Atticus began, folks were doing a lot of running that night. Let's see, you say you ran to the house, you ran to the window, you ran inside, you ran to Mayella, you ran for Mr. Tate. Did you, during all this running, run for a doctor? What no need to. I seen what happened. But there's one thing I don't understand, said Atticus. Weren't you concerned with Mayella's condition? I most positively was, said Mr. Ewell. I seen who done it. No, I mean her physical condition. Did you not think the nature of her injuries warranted immediate medical attention? What? Didn't you think she should have seen a doctor immediately? The witness said he never thought of it. He had never called a doctor to any of his in, in his life. And if he had, it would have cost him five dollars. That's all, he asked. Not quite, said Atticus casually. Mr. Ewell, you heard of the sheriff's testimony, didn't you? How's that? You were in the courtroom when Mr. Heck Tate was on the stand, weren't you? You heard everything he said, didn't you? 
Mr. Ewell considered the matter carefully and seemed to decide that the question was safe. Yes, he said. Do you agree with this description of Mayallo's injuries? How's that? Atticus looked around at Mr. Gilmer and smiled. Mr. Ewell seemed determined not to give the defense the time of day. Mr. Tate testified that her right eye was blackened and that she was be beaten around the... Oh, yeah, said the witness. I hold with everything Tate said. You do? asked Atticus mildly. I just want to make sure. He went to the court reporter, said something, and then the reporter entertained us for some minutes by reading Mr. Tate's testimony as if it were stock market quotations. Which eye? Her left. Oh, yes, that would make it a right. It was a right eye, Mr. Finch. I remember now she was banged up. He flipped the page up on that side of the face. Sheriff, please repeat what you said. It was her right eye, I said. Thank you, Bert, said Atticus. You heard it again, Mr. Ewell. Do you have anything to add to it? Do you agree with the sheriff? I holds with Tate. Her eye was blacked and she was mighty beat up. Mighty beat up. The little man seemed to have forgotten his previous humiliation from the bench. It was becoming evident that he thought Atticus an easy match. He seemed to grow ruddy again. His chest swelled and once more he was a red little rooster. I thought he would burst his shirt at Atticus's next question. Mr. Ewell, can you read and write? Mr. Gilmer interrupted. Objection, he said. Can't see what witnesses' literacy has to do with the case. Irrelevant and immaterial. Judge Taylor was about to speak, but Atticus said, Judge, if you'll allow me the question plus another one, you'll soon see. All right, let's see, said Judge Taylor, but make sure we see, Atticus. Overruled. Mr. Gilmer seemed as curious as the rest of us to what bearing the state of Mr. Ewell's education had on the case. I'll repeat the question, said Atticus. Can you read and write? I most positively can. Will you write your name and show us? I most positively will. How do you think I sign my relief checks? Mr. Ewell was endearing himself to his fellow citizens. The whispers and chuckles below us probably had to do with what a card he was. I was becoming nervous. Atticus seemed to know what he was doing, but it seemed to me that he'd gone frog sticking without a light. Never, never, never on cross-examination ask a witness a question you don't already know the answer to. Was a tenant I absorbed with my baby food. Do it, and you'll often get an answer you don't want, an answer that might wreck your case. Atticus was reaching into, his, into the inside pocket of his coat. He drew out an envelope, then reached into his vest pocket and unclipped his fountain pen. He moved leisurely and had turned so that he was in full view of the jury. He unscrewed the fountain pen cap and placed it gently on his table. He shook the pen a little, then handed it with the envelope to the witness. Would you write your name for us, he asked. Clearly now, so the jury can see you. Mr. Ewell wrote on the back of the envelope, and looked up complacently to see Judge Taylor staring at him as if he were some fragrant gardenia in full bloom on the witness stand. To see Mr. Gilmer half sitting, half standing at his table, the jury was watching him. One man was leaning forward with his hands over the railing. What's so interesting, he asked. You're left-handed, Mr. Ewell, said Judge Taylor. Mr. Ewell turned angrily to the judge and said he didn't see what his being left-handed had had to do with it, that he was a Christ-fearing man and that Atticus Finch was taking advantage of him. Tricking lawyers like Atticus Finch took advantage of him all the time with their tricking ways. He had told them what happened. He'd say it again and again, which he did. Nothing Atticus asked him after that shook his story. Then he'd looked through the window, then ran Tom Robinson off, then ran for the sheriff. Atticus finally dismissed him. Mr. Gilmer asked him one more question. About your writing with your left hand, are you ambidextrous, Mr. Ewell? I most positively am not. I can use one hand as good as the other. One hand as good as the other, he added, glaring at the defense table. Jem seemed to be having a quiet fit of it. He was pounding the balcony rail softly, and once he whispered, We've got him. I didn't think so. Atticus was trying to show, it seemed to me, that Mr. Ewell could have beaten up Mayella. That much I could follow. If her right eye was blacked, and she was beaten mostly on the right side of her face, it would tend to show that a left-handed person did it. Sherlock Holmes and Jem Finch would agree. But Tom Robinson could easily be left-handed, too. Like Mr. Heck Tate, I imagined a person facing me went through a swift mental pantomime and concluded that he might have held her with his right hand and pounded her with his left. I looked down at him, his back was to us, but I could see his broad shoulders and bull-thick neck. He could easily have done it, too. 
I thought Jem was counting his chickens.